Then I sent the hornet before you, and it drove out the two kings of the Amorites from before you, but not by your sword or your bow. I gave you a land on which you had not labored, and cities which you had not built, and you have lived in them. You are eating of vineyards and olive groves which you did not plant. Now therefore, fear the Lord, and serve him in sincerity and truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. If it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served, which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The people answered and said, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord, our God, is he who brought us and our fathers up out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage and who did these great signs in our sight and preserved us through all the way in which we went and among all the peoples through whose midst we passed. The Lord drove out from before us all the peoples, even the Amorites who lived in the land. We also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. And then Joshua said to the people, You will not be able to serve the Lord, for he is a holy God, he is a jealous God, he will not forgive your transgressions or your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do harm and consume you after he has done good to you. The people said to Joshua, No, but we will serve the Lord. Joshua said to the people, you are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen for yourselves the Lord to serve him. And they said, we are witnesses. Now, therefore, put away the foreign gods which are in your midst and incline your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. The people said to Joshua, we will serve the Lord, our God, and we will obey his voice. And so Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and made for them a statute and an ordinance in Shechem. And Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God. He took a large stone and set it up under the oak that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. And Joshua said to all the people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness against us, for it has heard all the words of the Lord which he spoke to us. Thus it shall be for a witness against you, so that you do not deny your God. Then Joshua Dismiss the people, each to his inheritance. The word of the Lord. As you can see by the uh, title of today's sermon, uh, this is the very end uh, of our sermon series. And Joshua actually is one more sermon, God willing, next week, them bones. And, um, but for today, we come to the end of his two-part farewell speech and uh, just to remind you or, or to inform you if you haven't been here for the previous sermons uh, the book opened by Joshua taking the baton from Moses and uh, Joshua is qualified to lead the people into the land of promise that God has given them and Moses was not qualified to do that but Joshua is and now Joshua is old and Joshua is about to die and he's passing the baton to the people and leaving the scene with these urgent words of blessing and warning which are given to the first generation of Israelites who will occupy the land that will serve as God's staging area so that all the Gentiles, all the nations of the earth can see what it is to serve the living and true God that they might become in the land of Israel a city set on a hill and an example of order and beauty for the whole world to emulate. Today's passage has a lot to do with a couple of concepts that I think are very important uh, to South Floridians. And in fact, they're important to all uh, Americans and all people in the West. And I would dare say uh, that even though not every nation of the world uses the same buzzwords that we use for these concepts, the ideas themselves, I think, are universally precious to people. A lot of talk 
about them, and that is the concepts of self-image or self-esteem and identity. Uh, we live in an age, I think, that the future will look back on and say that was the age of identity politics. And of course, the way we think about ourselves, self-esteem and identity. How we think about ourselves and then how we identify ourselves to other people. In, in other words, if you just had to take a slip of paper and write out a paragraph about yourself, and had to identify yourself. Tell me about you. What are the descriptors you would use to describe yourself? Would you, for instance, include in that paragraph, maybe even start off that paragraph, with a job description? I'm an accountant. I'm a plumber. I'm a teacher. I'm a nurse. Or would you perhaps uh, include something about marital status? I'm a divorced person. I'm a single person. Would you say something about gender. Of course, gender identity is very important in this particular age in which we live. Maybe you would say something, I'm a man, I'm a woman. Maybe something about ethnicity. Maybe something about your taste in music. Maybe you would include something about your age. Maybe you think that's important. Maybe something about your interests. I play the violin. I love great pieces of artwork. The, the who sang the song, right? Who are you? And it's a question very important to people in our own culture, and I think universally important to people in every culture. Who are you? How do you think of yourself? And how do you identify yourself to other people? How people think about themselves, that is their, their self-concept, is somehow related to the way we think about God. And those of you who have read the great magnum opus of, of uh, John Calvin, which I think was written when he was 26 years old, by the way, just to make you feel really bad about how little you've accomplished in this life. Uh, so John Calvin opens the Institutes of the Christian Religion, his great revolutionary work, with a description of how our self-concept and our God-concept are inseparable. And he questions whether one comes before the other or the other comes first. Must you think rightly about yourself before you can think rightly about God or must you think rightly about God before you can think rightly about yourself? And he ponders that and leaves us questioning. And that's what we want to talk about today. Your ideas about yourself and how they're affected by your ideas about God. What I want to look at today is one part of this speech that really bugs me an apparent incongruity in the speech. Secondly, a suggested resolution for that incongruity. And thirdly, what does it really mean to serve the Lord? And I want to give you a little secret today about a dirty word, the word commitment. Right? So again, uh, something that bugs me about this passage, a suggested resolution for the incongruity. And thirdly, uh, the truth about serving God, the truth about commitment. Uh, the second part of this farewell speech, uh, which we started at verse 12, but it actually starts at the start of the chapter, and we left off the first 11 verses, they are a rehearsal of historical events in the life of the Israelites. And all of these events, 15 or more significant people, places and events, they're all marshaled together. They're, they all combine to make one single point, and uh, Joshua is making that point to the people. Now, if, if I were trying to sway you, uh, maybe about a candidate or something that I'm voting for since voting season is coming up, whatever the argument I was trying to make, if I approached you, made my point, and then offered 15 lines of evidence to substantiate my case, I think you would be convinced. And that's exactly what God does through Joshua to the people. Fifteen lines of evidence to make one point. I'm not going to look at all fifteen, but let me just look at the first and the last. The first particular historic reference that Joshua uses to make the point has to do with the ancestral father of the Israelites. Terah, who was the father of Abraham and Nahor. And 
In verse 2, again, it's, we didn't include it in the bulletin today, but you, you would find these words in verse 2. From ancient times, your fathers lived beyond the river, namely Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor, and they served other gods. You see what he says there? Abraham, your father, in whom you take so much pride, Abraham our father, was an idol worshiper. He served other gods. Then I took your father from beyond the river, and, and I planted him in this land of, of Canaan. And then I promised to give him this land for his uh, people. And what he's saying there is, Abraham was not seeking me. Abraham was not looking for God. Abraham and his people were God avoiders. That's why they worshiped idols. They tried to put the forces of nature in packages so they could control the forces of nature, so they could control the forces of nature independent of God. It could be their own gods. They were God avoiders. But even though God, even though Abraham did not seek God, the point is, God sought Abraham. Abraham didn't qualify for me. I came to him. And then all these other names and places are listed, one after the other, 15 or more in total. And finally, he comes to the last point, which we did read today, and that has to do with Joshua's generation. It's basically saying to Joshua, you know when you came into the land, before you got to the river, you had to defeat two Amorite kings. And how did you do that? He says it in verse 12. Then I sent the hornet before you, and it drove out the two kings of the Amorites before you, but not by your sword or your bow. See, that, that's the kind of culmination of the speech. It, it's all coming together, combining to make one point. When I, the Lord, came to you, it was never in response to some qualifications I saw in you. I didn't come to you because you were good people, because you were good looking people. I didn't come to you because you were morally superior people. I didn't come to you because you were spiritually progressive people. There was no strength in you that drew me to you so that I could get something from you. I never needed anything from you. I never responded to your strengths. I always initiated with you seeing only weakness in you and seeing how my grace could meet your weakness. At least 15 significant examples of how Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, chose this people, not because they were good or deserving, but because he wanted to show his goodness, his truth, and his beauty to them and through them. And as we said last week, this is the one God among all the gods, who relates to his people not on the basis of karma and transaction, you do for him, then he does for you. Instead, he relates to his people like no other god on the basis of grace. And then, after demonstrating that this has always been the way God has treated us, says Joshua, it's always been by God's grace, undeserved favor, not about our earnestness that we're better than other people, not about our qualifications that, that we met. And then Joshua says, 15 repetitions of grace later, he says, therefore, yes, therefore what? Therefore, fear Yahweh. Serve him in sincerity and truth. Put away these gods, these idols you served in Babylon and Egypt and serve Yahweh. Very famous passage. Choose ye this day whom you will serve, Yahweh or the idols. And how did the people respond? <gasps> idols? Us serve idols? Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. And it seems to be the right answer. I mean, if I said to the congregation today, would you want to serve the living God, of God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, or some other gods? I wouldn't expect you to say, other gods. <laughs> that would just be weird. I would expect you to say, no, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I think I would applaud. And that's what bugs me about this passage. And I hope it bugs you. 
is Joshua doesn't applaud. Just the opposite. He doesn't respond the way I would hope that he would respond. With affirmation. You know, something to kind of pump up their self-image, their self-esteem. According to my own modern American standards, he's a bad motivator. You know, I'm looking for Joshua to put some pep in this pep rally, you know? And instead, what I find is a Debbie Downer and a dark and discouraging response. The people say, we will serve the Lord, and their not-so-positive leader responds, nah, you will not be able to serve the Lord. And I'm just wondering, why would he respond in that way? It bugs me. Does it bug you? What does he hope to gain? I mean, true, they don't have the best track record. And they seem to be kind of flimsy in their resolve. But again, Joshua, let's have some hope. This is a new generation. Surely they've learned a thing or two. Surely now is the time to say, go team, go. We can get her done. And the question is, what does Joshua hope to accomplish by his response? Well, evidently, and this is segueing into the second point, evidently he sees a tragic flaw in them that they do not see in themselves. They have an inaccurate self-image. And Joshua is going to help them with the way they think of themselves, but that's not where he's going to start. He actually starts with their God concept, and then he goes to their self-concept. Verse 19, then Joshua said to the people, you will not be able to serve the Lord, and here's the God concept, because he is a holy God, and secondly, he is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions or your sins. This God, God concept, this God, Yahweh, is not like the gods of Egypt or the gods of the Canaanites. He is unique. And you remember how I'm kind of hung up on that word? Unique. It doesn't mean different. It means only. One of a kind. That's why it starts with U-N. Remember? Un, one. This God is un. This God is only. One of a kind. And not only is he holy, he is jealous. Meaning he will not share you with abusers. And all the idols are abusers. I've told you before that this was the, the verse that's repeated uh, frequently in the Old Testament, that God is a jealous God. This is a verse that turned Oprah Winfrey away from Christianity. And she said, I can't serve any God who's jealous. And my response is, I can't serve any God who's not jealous. I mean, this God is saying, what, what husband wouldn't say? I would love for abusers to come and take my wife away. I wouldn't be a good husband. And this husband, Yahweh, is saying, I will not turn you over to spiritual abusers. And that's exactly what the idols are. I want God to be jealous over me. Nothing more could be more complimentary toward me. Idols, and we have them today. Just as many today, in fact, probably infinitely more than they had in the ancient world. Idols are tools that people use to try to control their lives, to try to control the forces of nature. That's why they, they served Baal, because Baal was the god of the, of the weather, god of the storms, why they served the, the Asherim. They were the gods of fertility that governed reproduction. That's why they served the gods of war, the gods of the sea, the gods of the mountains. And you can control the gods when you sort of package them in a little statue called an idol. You say, well, how do you control the weather? Well, you go before Baal, the weather god, and you give them an orange. You know, piece of fruit. If the storm comes anyway, then the next time you give them some fruit and some incense. And if the storm comes anyway, then the next time you give them an orange, an incense, and a piece of meat. 
like a sacrifice. If that doesn't work, you keep escalating until you sacrifice your own children in order to control the God who controls the weather. But it's all an illusion that makes you feel like you are in control. And the God of the Israelites, Yahweh, is saying, I, on the other hand, can't be controlled. I am the only God who acts in history and is not dependent on worshipers to feed me. You remember, Israelites, you never fed me. I fed you. 40 years in the wilderness to remind you that I'm not hungry. I take care of the hungry. I've been fighting for you. I chose you. I'm holy. Not like any of the fake gods, and any of the statues that are only projections of your own self. I'm different. And I married you. I committed myself to you, and I love you. And I will not sit by idly, excuse the pun, I will not sit by idly and watch you be victimized by gods that are not gods at all, that are at best projections of yourself, at worst, demonic spirits. I am the only true and living God, unique, and I relate to you as I related to Abraham from the start, not on the basis of his deserving, but on the basis of my grace. But you, you keep turning it into a transaction. It's not. And Joshua sees what they cannot see in themselves. Because they seem to be saying, okay, Joshua, we get it. Yahweh saved us from the people of the land. And I think what we hear you saying is, it's now time for us to repay the favor. Because we know how it works in this life. There's no such thing as a free lunch. You only get what you pay for. And I think we hear what you're saying, Joshua, that this Yahweh saved us and defended us and drove out the people from the land, so now it's time for us to repay him. He helped us, and now it's our time to help him. We will serve the Lord. And I think you can see, if this was the people's platform, why Joshua really wouldn't be very excited about it. And no wonder he's saying, as long as you try to relate to the sovereign God of grace on the basis of transaction, on the basis of deals, on the basis of karma, you do for him, then he does for you, he does for you, then you repay back to him. As long as you try to relate to God as basically the same way as you, as you relate to the idols, he's like the best of all the idols. As long as you relate to him on that way, he will not forgive your sins on the basis of transaction. He's not that way. He's holy. He's one of a kind. You can't give him like the place of honor on your God shelf. The only way you can serve this God is to tear down the God shelf altogether and recognize that this God is completely different. He's holy and he will not share you with abusive imposters in the idols. And tied to this understanding of God, tied to their God concept, is their understanding of themselves. Who are they? Joshua is trying to make it clear. Who are you? The first thing you should write on the paragraph where you describe yourself is that you people are the bride of Yahweh. That's your core identity. You are his cherished people. You are the object of his affection. He loves you with an everlasting love. That's who you are. Not based on your deserving, but based on his sovereign love. That's who you are. It's your core identity. And another facet of their identity, you people, says Joshua, are wired for worship. You have to worship. We, I'm talking to you now, I'm talking to you. <laughs> we have to worship. It's why Joshua never said, I don't know if, you, if this stuck out in your mind, you can serve Yahweh, you can serve the gods of Egypt, you can serve the gods of Canaanite, Canaanites, or you can serve no god at all. He doesn't say that. 
Option three is no option at all. You have to worship. Everyone you know is a worshiper. In a couple weeks, you may have people over for Thanksgiving. You may have your atheist brother-in-law sitting at the table with you. You may ask him why he doesn't worship. And he says, I don't believe in worship. I would never worship. And I'm here to tell you, he does worship. Everyone you know worships. Even atheists have something that they trust supremely, something that they fear supremely, something that they value supremely, and that thing is what they worship. All people worship, even atheists. Bob Dylan was right. You're going to have to serve somebody because we're wired to worship, and Joshua wants them to see that. But the other thing that these people, and we too, don't see in themselves is their and our absolute contempt for and antipathy toward the grace of God. Now, you might object. You might say, TJ, who could possibly be against grace? It's a free gift. That's just the problem. We don't want a free gift. We want something that we can earn and eventually something we can control. And that's why we're all kind of like allergic to grace until God changes us and makes us receptive toward grace. Grace is not something we can control. Grace is God's initiative. We can't buy it. We can't sell it. We can't qualify for it. We can't go up to heaven to bring it down. We can't start on the earth and muster it up. And yet, when grace finds us out, when God dispatches grace toward us, as it were, and when the Spirit of God applies grace to us and inspires faith in us so that we can receive that grace, that grace begins to transform us. And little by little, under the influence of grace, we begin to lose that formerly cherished illusion that we are in control. And little by little, under the influence of grace, we begin to revel in the truth that the God of grace, the unique God of sovereign grace, is in control. I don't know if you've ever read uh, Jonathan Edwards' own little testimony, how he went from thinking about a God who could kind of be controlled and transforming in his own mind his own God concept to a God who could not be controlled in any way, a God who was completely sovereign. And he says, at first I thought it was revolting, but more and more under the influence of grace, I begin to think it was the sweetest concept in the whole world, that God is in control of everything. And the way this transformation begins in our God concept, our thinking, and the way it progresses into our hearts and lives, is that we come to see this historical survey of the way God has always dealt with his children. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Joshua, Ruth, David, Esther. And we trace that train, that, that chain of, of God's gracious activities among people. We trace it all the way to the end of God's saving acts in history. And we get to the place where this God this holy and jealous God was so intent on having us that he literally showed up on the scene. He became a human being, a helpless baby in the womb of a virgin, and he entered time and space by taking to himself a true body and a rational soul, being conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin Mary and born of her yet without sin. And he, the second person of the Holy Trinity, came to us as the embodiment of grace. He's unique. No other spiritual program or deity has this. A God who enters history, a God who takes responsibility for the failings of his own people. And what does this mean? What does this God concept do to my self-image? Well, for one thing, it means that I must have been really, really, really messed up if that's what it takes to fix me. The only way that I could be fixed 
was for God to become a man and live the life I failed to live and died the death that I deserve to die. It means that this God really loves me in a way that no one or no thing could ever love us. This is John Coltrane's love supreme. It's a love that is not transactional, not controllable, but a love that is beautifully compelling and transformative. At the end of this scene, Joshua sets up this stone. Remember, I just read about it? And I'm sure the people are like, what's, what's up with the big rock, Joshua? He says, oh, this stone hurt everything that went on today. Has heard all the words of God and heard all the words of your, your commitment to God. And I'm setting it up because you people are still wallowing around in karma. And this is a witness against you. But at the end of history, the history of God's acts, God sets up another monument. It is the monument of a man suspended on a Roman cross, hanging to death under the weight of the justice that I deserve. And a God who, a man who once he pays for my sins, rises to show that my ransom has been accepted. And this is the witness of grace. It changes the way I think about God and it changes the way I think of myself. It liberates me, for instance, to face the worst things about my own character. When I am really believing in the great monument and the finished work of Jesus Christ, the rock who is a witness for me, not against me. When I'm really believing him, I can accept criticism from you because it doesn't really shake my self-image. I can stop hiding my flaws. I can stop blaming others. I can stop making excuses or trying to find a million different ways to inflate my ego so I feel better about myself. I can stop comparing myself to worse people so that I feel good about me. I can stop competing. And instead I can say, and I know I've said this many times, I originally heard it from Jack Miller. Instead I can say, cheer up. I am much worse off than I think I am. I cannot serve the Lord. But on the other hand, I can say, because of Jesus Christ, in Jesus Christ, I am so cherished, so secure, so significant. Amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? doesn't get any better than that. And that's the paradoxical self-image that the Christian bears. None of the modern gods, money, success, escape, applause, power, comfort, none of these gods that you have to feed and water and carry around. It's like pumping up a raft that has a big hole in it when you try to get satisfaction from any of these false gods. None of these gods can help me. They have to be served by me. None of them can love me as God does in Jesus Christ. Now here's the thing about commitment. I told you I was gonna say something about that dirty word, right? The, the, the truth about serving God is this. Before you can ever serve God, God has to serve you. And I know that's humbling, but isn't that exactly what Jesus Christ came to do? God became a man, and in Jesus Christ, he served men. He served those fishermen with the dirty feet. He washed their feet, he served them, and he washes our souls, he serves us. And the only way to get that is to humble yourself. And when you do, it'll feel like you're dying. And in a sense, you are. The old person is on his way out, and a new person is being born. And when we get that, when we see, TJ, cheer up. You're a bigger sinner than you think you are. But in the gospel, you are secure and loved like you've never dreamed. When I get that, my heart starts to move toward this holy God who is committed to me. I begin to see 
that he doesn't need my service and that my obedience and my life are his workmanship and his tools to shape me. It's a big difference between that and religion. That's his commitment to us that liberates our love and service to him. Bottom line of the whole sermon is this. My commitment to this holy and jealous God is at best an expression of my trust in his commitment to me. That's it. Let me pray for us. Father, we ask that in this coming week, this would come home to us again and again, that we would revel in your commitment to us, that we would know that you are going to change our hearts, are going to incline us uh, toward you, to serve you in spirit and truth. Help us, Lord, to know that you're shepherding us through the highs and lows of this coming week. And help us, Lord, to love you, to fear you, to understand who you are, to understand who we are, and may that make all the difference. Father, if there are any men, women, or children in this congregation today who have not been drawn to the gospel, have not come to believe, we pray that you, by your gracious spirit, would open their eyes to see the great beauty of the gospel and that today they would find, as one of your servants said, their hearts strangely warmed in coming to believe in the gospel so that this means everything to them. Move on them. Move on us, Lord. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.